The lecture today is going to focus both on 6.5 and 6.6. We're going to talk about China and Japan together. This is because the nations start off kind of in a similar place where they both get taken advantage of by the West, but they take two radically different routes to kind of fix those problems. And we're going to talk about one empire that rises and one empire that kind of collapses. So our first one we're going to talk about today is going to be China. And China is the one that ends up really collapsing because of two things. A, they don't modernize, and B, they don't reform their government. So the vocabulary for this section is kind of important because it's a lot of terms you've probably never heard of before. The first one is balance of trade. And this is the difference between how much a country exports, which is sells, and imports, which is buys. Trade surplus is where a country is exporting more things than it's importing, which means a country is making money, so it's selling more things than it's buying. A trade deficit is where a country is importing more things than it's exporting, so it's buying, importing more things than it is selling. An indemnity is just a payment for a loss in a war, so if your side loses a war and you're forced to pay the other side, you're paying an indemnity. The most important one on here is extraterritoriality. This is the rights of people to be protected by their own laws, even if they aren't, aren't in their own nation. Think of this as someone from the United States goes to France and they break a French law. Usually they would just get arrested because you have to follow the laws in France. If you had extraterritoriality, though, if you broke a law in France and that law wasn't illegal in the United States, then you wouldn't be arrested in France because you don't follow France's laws. You follow the United States's. So the West had been interested in China for a long time, and the Chinese very, very strictly controlled the trade of their goods. The Chinese had a lot of goods that the West actually wanted. There was silk, there was porcelain. But the West didn't have a lot of things that China wanted. So the balance of trade was very much in favor of China. The Industrial Revolution, though, changes all this. Suddenly, the Europeans need new markets to sell all their cheap goods they're producing in factories. And also, the Chinese start to have a want for a lot of Western goods that are made in those factories. So this starts what's called the century of humiliation in China, and this is basically a century of time from the 1800s all the way up into the 1900s where the Western powers pretty much dominate China. The difference between China and a lot of the imperialism we've already learned about is China is actually not going to get taken over. The Westerners don't take that many areas of China. It's more they want a sphere of influence there so they can sell things and have access to the markets that the Chinese have. So the first kind of step in the century of humiliation is the Opium Wars. And when Britain took India, they discovered that India could produce a lot of opium, which is a drug, and they found out China liked it, so they began to sell it in China. This reverses the balance of trade. Now China is spending more money on Western goods instead of the Westerners spending money on Chinese goods, so China is losing money. The Chinese government, just like any government would when there's a drug problem, outlaws the drug. France and Britain then say that China is actually interfering with their ability to trade because they outlawed the drug. There's a war, and the Chinese are defeated mostly because the Western militaries are so advanced. If you look at this down here, you can see the Western militaries are steamships made of steel, and the Chinese ships are still wind-powered made of wood and bamboo and paper. This starts a tradition of China having to sign unequal treaties. So in these unequal treaties, some of the things China has to do is pay indemnities. So they lose the war. They have to then pay the European powers, mostly in gold. They have to open up cities and ports to trade. They have to grant extra, those extraterritoriality rights to Europeans. And they have to give something called the Most Favored Nation Clause. This is where if Britain makes a deal with China, then if the United States is the most favored nation, the United States also gets that deal. So it kind of makes it so if China makes a deal with one Western nation, they're making a deal with all the Western nations. This really begins to start a tradition of the Western powers and Japan beginning to take advantage of China and making them sign these unequal treaties. <laughs> 
So during the time of a lot of these unequal treaties, there's also a giant rebellion in China called the Taiping Rebellion. And this rebellion is led by a guy who uh, believed he was the son of God and was the brother of Jesus. And he starts a rebellion based on reforming society. And at this time, China had a lot of issues with its peasants. There was a lot of corruption. There was starvation. There weren't enough resources to go around. So the peasants support this guy. And their cult eventually takes control of large parts of China, even the capital city at one point. But the Qing dynasty does rise up and defeat the rebellion. And the rebellion has a huge impact on China. First, it just leaves 20 to 70 million people dead. It's one of the most destructive wars in human history. Um, Chinese peasants and their soldiers absolutely go at it. There's no prisoners taken. And it ends up being a weakening of the Qing dynasty. The Qing dynasty is severely weakened. That's the ruling dynasty of China at this time because they literally had to pour everything they had into putting this rebellion down. This makes some calls to modernize China. People see that China is having issues ruling itself, let alone resisting the Western powers. So some people say China needs to modernize itself. The issue, the issue is China is going to be divided on how they should modernize. They don't want to give up being Chinese, but at the same time, they know that they have to adopt some of the Western ways. Another kind of thing that happens to China is uh, a diplomatic agreement between the Western powers, which is the open door policy. So this is the idea that Chinese trade should be open to everybody. Remember, the Westerners aren't actually trying to seize land in China, they want access to the markets. This is the United States' idea where the U.S. says everybody has a sphere of influence in China and everybody can sell things there. There's more than enough people for everybody to have access to those markets and trade. So the Chinese, seeing that they are getting taken advantage of, they're seeing that they're losing wars, they're seeing they have rebellions in their own nation, they start what's called the self-strengthening movement. This is about a 30-year period where China is going to try and modernize itself into a modern industrial nation. The focus is going to be modernizing the military. China sees the military losses that they've had and the difficulty they had putting down the Qing Rebellion, so their goal is modernize their military, both their army and their navy. Their secondary goal is industrializing China and building the factories that can support that modern military. The Qing dynasty, though, does not so fully support it. The government isn't fully behind the modernization, and it doesn't really succeed. Because they don't modernize, they then lose in the next slide, which is the Sino-Japanese War, and then that totally ends this movement. So the first Sino-Japanese War only lasts for about a year, and Sino means Chinese, so this is between the Japanese and the Chinese. And this is a conflict for control of this area here, which is Korea. So Korea was what's called a client kingdom. They were technically independent, but the Chinese ruled over them. And the Japanese, who have industrialized, they want control of Korea. Japan, who has modernized itself, if you look at this picture down on the right-hand corner, easily defeats China, and they take Korea and an island that would be right around down here where my mouse is called Taiwan. This leads to more calls to modernize China. They have now lost their second or third war against a Western power, and they see that the Western powers and now Japan are beginning to pull away from them. This also reveals weaknesses within China, and the Western powers begin to demand more of those trade ports and more of those cities to be open to them. This leads to the next stage of reform, and it's going to be called the Hundred Days Reform. This is China's next chance to modernize. And since they didn't totally modernize with the self-strengthening movement, this is going to be like shock modernization. They're going to try and do it as fast as they can. The emperor, who's down the right-hand corner, completely overhauls Chinese society. He doesn't focus as much on the military and on industrialization as he tries to reform their education system and make China modernized from within instead of importing Western technology. This angers a lot of the conservative Chinese, the more traditional Chinese, who then overthrow the emperor and they completely end the reforms. That overthrow was actually led by his mother right here, and she wanted, you can see, she's very traditional Chinese. She wants to keep China traditional, and it ends China's chances of modernizing before they're really going to be um, overpowered by the Western powers in Japan. 
after those chances of modernization, a group um, called the Society of the Har Righteous and Harmonious Fists begins to form, and they are a group that believes China needs to purge itself of all the Western influences. They start what's called the Boxer Rebellion, and they're called boxers because they practice martial arts, and the Westerners thought that they were boxing, and they also practice this like religious cult kind of thing that made them think they would be immune to bullets. They were not, um, but they ended up rebelling, and they wanted to get rid of the Western and Christian influences, so they began attacking citizens of Japan and the Western empires and killing them and expelling them. This leads to what's called the Eight Nation Alliance, where all the major imperial nations who have interest in China form an alliance together, and they invade China to protect their citizens. The alliance wins, and again, they make Japan – or China, sorry – sign more of those unequal treaties. You can see in this picture here, the troops of the Eight Nation Alliance are actually in the palace of the emperor in the Forbidden City. This really discredits the Qing Dynasty and will eventually be one of the largest reasons for its fall. So here we have the Eight Nation Alliance. This guy is going to be British. We have the Americans, the Russians, the Indians who are with the British, Germans, the French, Austro-Hungarians, the Italians, and the Japanese. So the Chinese begin to question the Qing rule. They, they begin to say, if the Qing can't defend us, who should? The Qing emperor is a child at this point in the 1900s. He's literally a six-year-old boy, and they're just tired of all the foreign control over their country. So a group called the Republicans re rebel, and they want to overthrow the Qing dynasty and form a democracy. They want to make a Chinese republic. Eventually, they negotiate with the Qing, and the emperor abdicates, which means he gives up his throne. And in 1912, the Chinese republic is founded. It's based on what's called the three principles of the people, which is this guy, Sun Yat-sen's ideas, and it's nationalism, democracy, and livelihood, that China needs to have nationalism, they need to be proud of being Chinese, they need to have a democracy, and livelihood, they need to have a modern economy, so they need to modernize. This will kind of be the end of old China and the formation of the new Chinese Republic will pretty much immediately become in contact and conflict with the Chinese communists. Our next group we're going to talk about is going to be Japan. And while to summarize China, China kind of failed to modernize and collapse, Japan is going to do the exact opposite. They're going to embrace modernization, and then they're going to go out and form their own imperial empire. So the Meiji Restoration, that's the most important thing you need to have down here. And this is the reign of Emperor Meiji from uh, the mid-1860s all the way up until the 1910s. And he is going to be a reformer industrialized Japan. A Zabatsu is a super rich, powerful family in Japan. They're going to be important with the industrialization. And a homogeneous society is a society where most of the people are the same. They share the same culture, language, religion. Japan is an example of this, where they're 99.99% Japanese even today. The United States, on the other hand, is a heterogeneous society, where we have many different cultures and many different religions and languages all living in society together. So the background on Japan, originally, this guy in the upper right-hand corner, who is named the Shogun, he had kept Japan isolated from the rest of the world for 250 years. They didn't want any other influences in Japan other than being Japanese. Well, what happens is the West modernizes, and the West begins to be, get, get more powerful than Japan. So the United States wants to open Japan up to trade. We want to sell things to Japan. So the United States sends a ship. And they force Japan to open up to trade. We tell the Japanese if they don't open up to trade, we'll actually bombard some of their cities. This embarrasses the Japanese and they're angry. So just like China, they're taken advantage of. But the difference is the samurai end up overthrowing the shogun and they put the emperor back in power. And the emperor who rises to power is Emperor Meiji, it's the guy in the right-hand corner. And you can compare and contrast him to the shogun. So the shogun on the previous slide, he was very traditional Japanese, but you can see Meiji is dressed like a modern, like European general. Meiji wants to adopt modernization to Japan. He believes that Japan can still stay Japanese, but can modernize its own way. So the first thing he does is he reforms the entire government. He creates a constitution that puts all power pretty much with him. 
and he makes all men begin to serve in the military and he begins to modernize the military. You can see the new Japanese military down here. They're dressed like U.S. soldiers from the Civil War because the United States gives Japan all its military equipment. I wouldn't say give, we sell it to them because that was the goal. But Japan begins to modernize along American lines. The second thing he does is industrialize the nation. He wants to modernize and industrialize Japan, build their own factories, their own railroads, their own canals, make their own weapons, their own ships. And the, how Japan does this so quickly, they literally go from swords and horseback to 40 years later building battleships. The government would actually build a factory, and then the government would sell it to a rich banking family called a Zabatsu. And then the families would run the factory. This allows the government to put factories exactly where they need them, when they need them. He overhauls Japanese society by ending the class distinctions. Originally, Japan had a really rich class structure where if you were born into the samurai class you stayed a samurai if you were a merchant you stayed a merchant he makes it where everybody is just japanese the schools are modernized they begin to teach modern engineering modern math modern science and they promote japanese nationalism to be proud of being japanese so the meiji restoration succeeds where in china the self-strengthening movement fails it's a huge success mostly because a, Japan is homogeneous. Everybody was Japanese. So that nationalism began to grow, and everybody wanted to do things to make Japan strong. So the men joined the military not because they have to, but because they want to make Japan strong. The families are not just producing steel and ships to m make money. They're doing it to make Japan strong. Eventually, Japan goes on then to revise all their treaties with the West and become an imperial power themselves. So because Japan is industrialized, they face the same issue that Britain did a long time ago, where they're an island, they don't have a lot of resources. The solution is for them to go out and build their own empire to get the resources they need. They need to colonize other places. So the first way they expand is the Sino-Japanese War. We've already gone over this, where they defeat China. They take control of Korea and Taiwan. The next one is actually even a bigger deal because it's the Russo-Japanese War, and this is between Russia and Japan, and it starts over control of Korea and Manchuria. At that point, Russia pretty much controlled Manchuria, which is part of northern China, and they had been edging in slowly on Korea. Japan doesn't want this, and Japan pulls the underdog victory. Before this, no Eastern Empire, so Asian Empire, had defeated the Western European powers. Japan absolutely destroys the Russians. They just sink an entire Russian fleet, capture a whole Russian army, and they even capture a Russian city, and they take control of all Korea and Manchuria. So now Japan has the areas it needs to ship its resources back to Japan. So in Korea and Manchuria, they modernize and they industrialize those two areas, but they don't do it for Korea and Manchuria. The Japanese modernize it so that they can extract resources from Korea and Manchuria to send back to Japan. They wage also like a campaign against Korean culture to try and turn Korea into Japan and make it loyal to the Japanese. So that kind of compares and contrasts China and Japan, and if you need any help, just let me know.